I'm Steve Wiggins, and this is the Groundworks Ministries podcast. Today we're in Matthew chapter 15. So let's just jump right in and begin reading now. Matthew 15 begins in this way. Then the scribes and the Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. Let's focus for a moment on the beginning where he says, The scribes and the Pharisees who were from Jerusalem. Now just a quick review on who scribes and Pharisees were and what it is that they believed. The Pharisees, known as the Pirushim, or the separate ones, separated from militant zealots. And the zealots were militantly zealous for war, and the Pharisees were militantly zealous for Judaism. And the scribes that Jesus interfaces with came in two varieties. First, there were the older experts of the law, and uh, they were experts in the Jewish extra-biblical rabbinical tradition. And they were mainly located in Jerusalem near the temple and consider them seminary professors. But the second type of scribe that Jesus was interfacing with would be an unordained seminary student. So one level of scribe at the high level was a professor. The second level, the lower level, would be a scribe. And they were yet to be be ordained. And they were strictly forbidden to teach anything contrary to their teacher. And they couldn't contradict tradition, and they did not have the authority to make any personal interpretations of Scripture. So what it looks like here in verse 1 is that the unordained student scribes who were sent up to the northern Galilee to sort of ply their trade and you know learn how to preach, let's put this stuff into practice, uh, the unordained student scribes had gone back to Jerusalem. And then they had given testimony about Jesus' teaching and the miracles and, and, and how they couldn't quite answer these questions. And so the Pharisee leaders, along with the seminary professors, came to show the students, you know, this is how we deal with heretics in Jerusalem. Now, chapter 15, verse 2, like I said, they ask a question. These, these uh, scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem, they said, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders, for they don't wash their hands when they eat bread. Let's break this down. In contrast to their disciples, it was a condescending remark when the Pharisees and the scribes from Jerusalem said, hey, your disciples, because Jesus was not ordained by any known seminary or sect of Judaism. Therefore, the Pharisees' statement was intended to denigrate both the teacher for disregarding uh, teaching the piety of being a, you know, a, a proper Jewish uh, religious authority. Uh, he wasn't teaching that to his students. They're not acting in the way that a student should act. And they were also denigrating the students of a non-accredited teacher for being less pious than their scribes. They say, why, does, why do they not uh, uh, go along with the tradition of the elders? Or why do they transgress the tradition of the elders? Well, rabbinical interpretation of Scripture had become more important by that time in Jewish history than the Scripture itself. Now, they never would admit this, but in practice, that's exactly what was happening. Now, imagine a preacher who never read the Bible, but he only read commentaries on the Bible. But uh, he only quoted Spurgeon or Martin Luther or John Calvin or whoever, and, and he never was into God's Word. What if they used commentaries to weigh the Bible instead of using the Bible to weigh the commentators. And that pretty much describes Judaism and, quite frankly, many churches in our generation. And that mentality still remains among uh, some of the people in modern, even the Messianic Jewish community, that is, Jewish believers in Yeshua or Jesus. And they sometimes drift towards some form of rabbinic Judaism that isn't even biblical, because we have to understand that rabbinic Judaism, as we know it, was invented around 90 A.D. You say, how does that, how does that happen? How is, what are you saying? Well, in 70 A.D., the Romans destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. And over about 20 years later or so, a remnant of Jewish leaders gathered to determine how to worship God without a temple. And in the second and third centuries, they compiled works of rabbinic tradition called the Mishnah. And in the fourth and fifth centuries, they compiled more uh, rabbinic teaching into a collection called the Gemara. 
And later, the Mishnah and the Gemara were sort of joined together in order to form a canon of uh, religious thinking called the Talmud. And now the Talmud is what most rabbis would spend uh, the majority of their time studying even today. And they seek rabbinical tradition and traditional interpretation as a guide to godly living instead of just simply seeking the word of the Lord. They use human reasoning to reason the things of the Lord and they use the reasoning of other humans versus the Holy Spirit's teaching. Now, think about this. We have a gift. Whether you've been to seminary or not, the moment that you become a Christian, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. And you know what the Holy Spirit's ministry is? It is to teach you the word of the Lord. 1 John 2, 27 says this, But the anointing which you have received from Him abides in you. It sticks around. And you don't need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it is taught you, you will abide in Him. You see, guys, the Holy Spirit teaches us to perceive and to understand, which is different from reasoning. He teaches us to think biblically as the Spirit has revealed the truth. So they said to him, why do they transgress the tradition of the elders, right? Speaking of this rabbinic tradition. Now, he's not talking about transgressing the Bible because they don't wash their hands when they eat. Well, in the book of Exodus, Moses was commanded to make a wash basin for the Levitical priests to wash themselves before they served in the tabernacle. And we see it here in Exodus chapter 30, verses 18 through 20. He says, And you shall make a laver of bronze, which is just basically a bowl of bronze, with its base also bronze for washing. And you shall put it between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar. And you shall put water in it. Verse 19 says, For Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet uh, in water from it. He goes on to say in verse 20, And when they go into the tabernacle of meeting, or when they come near to the altar to minister, to uh, burn, uh, burn an offering made by fire to the Lord, they shall wash with water, lest they die. Okay, That's what the Lord commanded Moses for the priests. But here's how man-made reasoning and rabbinic tradition comes in. Because rabbinical tradition expanded God's word, which was for the Levites, in a specific function of serving him as he prescribed them, rabbinic tradition had expanded God's word to include all Israelite men. The rabbis argued that a man's dinner table is his altar from his home because every Shabbat, the elements of candlelight, which represents the temple menorah, challah bread and wine, which represents the grain and the drink offerings, those things are present on every man's table at the Sabbath. Hence, Human reasoning, rabbinical tradition said, hence every Jewish man is a priest in his own home. And in a sense, that's true, but it doesn't mean you have to act like a Levitical priest in your own home. So the Pharisees ruled that every man has to bathe like a priest. And this is what man-made religion always does. It says that God's word is not clear enough. The people aren't smart enough to figure it out. They're not strong enough to live according to it. And so what we will do is we will add to the word of the Lord. And of course, whoever adds new law becomes the default enforcer of that law because they're the ones that added it. So now we understand these are scribes and Pharisees from Jerusalem. So these are experts. They're denigrating Jesus and his disciples for not acting like, like their disciples were acting. And the way they weren't acting right was they weren't washing their hands in the way that rabbinic tradition said that you should, even though the Bible never said that. Now, let's move on. In 15 verse 3, And Jesus answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God? Because of your tradition." Now, the Pharisees attacked Jesus for breaking man-made tradition. And Jesus returns, not by answering their question, but exposing their sin, not against man-made tradition, but against God's Word, of which they are the self-proclaimed guardians of the Bible. So let's keep reading in Matthew chapter 15, verse 4. It's pretty fun, isn't it? 
Chapter 4, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 15, verse 4 says this, For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses his father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God. So God commands that you say this. Man commands that. Well, I don't worry about that. God commands this, and you don't do what the Lord is commanding. So here it is clear how blind the people can become. And that's you and me too, if we'll humble ourselves and receive that. When they're not led to a daily appointment with the Holy Spirit in God's Word, well, then if you don't know how to stand on God's Word, then you'll fall for anything. And how can you lead others astray when the community of believers are also not reading God's Word? Think about that. If, if, if you're not reading the Word and you're just reading rabbinic tradition as a pastor, and now you're just teaching, or let's say church tradition, and now you're just teaching church tradition, and you're not teaching the Word of the Lord, then the people aren't going to the Word of the Lord. And so therefore, if the people don't know the Word, they just know your traditional thoughts and ideas and opinions on the Bible. Well, then you can lead people astray because a, a company that does not know the Word of the Lord... Uh, they don't know how to stand on the word of the Lord or say even to their own pastor, hey, that's not biblical. Just as no Mormon or Jehovah's Witness expects to meet a real Bible-believing Christian whenever they ring the doorbell, because most Christians don't read the Bible, the Pharisees were not expecting to speak with the living word of God, the word of God made flesh. And we see that in John 1 verse 14, where it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, speaking of Jesus. And they're no easier to convince than uh, that they're in a cult. If you have a Jehovah's Witness or you have a Mormon or some other cult person come to your door and they're trying to use the Bible in order to push their cult on you, they're not, as, they're not easy to convince that they're in a cult because they have really been drilled into this cult religious stuff. So, so even when you confront them with biblical truth, they can't be changed with biblical truth in that way simply because they've been taught that the Bible says something else. Okay, And that's because they've also found a sense of belonging in the cult, which goes beyond the Bible. It just goes to a, I have a uniform code that I live by. I found some kind of a family in this cult and now they've given me a secret knowledge, which these stupid people that I'm talking to now, they don't have it. And so I'm trying to give it to them. That's the way they feel when they meet a Bible-believing Christian who's actually showing them what the Bible says. They don't have any capacity to receive it. But mostly they're fearful of losing that feeling of family. And they will often stay in a cult no matter how dysfunctional and unbiblical that it is, even when they have been exposed. He says there in the same verse that we just read, whatever profit that you have received from me, this is what the Pharisees were and the scribes were saying to their parents. The parent says, hey, could you come over here, help me work on the yard or get this thing fixed? Oh, I can't do that. I have to do my priestly duties. But just know this, Dad, that whatever profit you may have received from me, I'm not going to give that to you. But the fact that you're not requiring it of me, well, then you should consider that to be a gift to the Lord. <laughs> Have you ever heard of the term Jesus juke? It's a term I think kids use more and more. It's, it's used in the Christian music business, of which I've come from. Whenever somebody tries to use Jesus out of context of the Scripture in order to manipulate you, right? If, if somebody promised you in a contract to pay you a certain amount of money and then... Uh, you, you come to them and say, okay, well, now I've done what I said that I would do in the contract. Now pay me this money. And they say, oh, I'm so sorry, brother. You know, we just don't have the money. But you know what? This is all for the Lord, you know, and I'm sure the Lord will make it up some way in the future. Well, that's what we call a Jesus juke. Somebody's using Jesus to manipulate you and not do what they promised to do. And Jesus is calling out the Pharisees' Yahweh juke. <laughs> the Pharisees were telling their parents, that they're too busy serving the Lord. And, and so I don't have the time nor the spare resources to help you because what I'm doing is so important to the kingdom. But that's okay because your parents, 
The, the, those parents, they can rest knowing that God will bless them for allowing their children to serve Him without hindering their children. It's just like saying to them, you know what, you can write off this expenses on your taxes. Or maybe they're saying, you know, consider it a gift to the Lord. So do you think that my labor would be 50 shekels? Okay, well then just write that off on your tithes. Because it was a gift to the Lord that I, you didn't make me come away from my important duties to help you rake the leaves out of the yard. You laugh at it, but that's exactly the way so many people justify not doing what the Bible says and then make themselves look pious for not living according to the Word. And just as man-made religion is enforced by whoever makes that man-made religion, well then that maker also becomes the greatest beneficiary of that man-made religion. Matthew chapter 15 verse 6 goes on to say this, And then if you say this to your father and mother, he says, And then you need not honor your father and mother, thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. What commandment of God are they going against? Well, you're robbing your father and your mother. Look at what it says in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 24. He says, Whoever robs his father or mother and says it's not a transgression to do so, the same is a companion to the destroyer. That's Satan. He says here in uh, Jeremiah chapter 8, verses 8 through 10, he says, How can you say we're wise? And the law of the Lord is with us. Look, the false pen of the scribe works certainly falsehood, or certainly works falsehood. Now, who was standing before Jesus? Was it not the scribes? Well, the false pen of the scribe is working falsehood. Guess what? Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Just as in the days of the Proverbs, the same thing was happening. He goes on to say in verse 9, Wise men are ashamed, and they are dismayed, and they are taken. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord. So what wisdom do they have? Therefore, I will give their wives to others, and their fields to those who will inherit them, <clears throat> because the least of these... Even to the greatest, everyone is given to covetousness. From the prophet, even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they have hewn for themselves cisterns, rabbinical traditions, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Matthew chapter Five, uh, 15 verse 8 goes on to say this, These people draw near to me with their lips, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as the doctrines are, as doctrines the commands of men. And we see this even with many pastors. It's sad. He goes on to say, uh, well, let's just consider verse 9 just for a moment wordless worship, that is, when you worship the Lord without the Bible, wordless worship is heartless worship. And that is man-made worship leads people to vainly worship. So wordless worship leads to heartless worship, which leads to man-made worship, which leads to people who worship the Lord in vain. And we see two commandments at play here. Number one, the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother uh, that you may live long in the land that the Lord has given to you. And then you see commandment number three, uh, do not receive the name of the Lord in vain. To say that you are the people of God and not live as people of the word means that you are worshiping him in vain. And it is possible, by the way, to be sincere in your worship and yet be sincerely wrong. I heard Adrian Rogers say that once. In a generation that professes my truth and your truth, always read the same passage. Well, what does that say to you? Did you know it doesn't matter what the Bible says to you? Consider this. I heard John MacArthur say this a while back. It's not a question of what does the Bible mean to you and what does the Bible mean to me as if we could get two different truths out of it. No, there is only one truth and that is the truth that God intended. So the question is not what does the Bible say to you, but what does the Bible say even if you were never born? Because the Bible only says one thing, it is unchanging 
and therefore it endures forever. So you don't say, oh, I have my truth or your truth. No, we've lost God's truth, even in the church. And uh, judgment will not be weighed by any other truth but God's word. When we stand before him, he's not going to say, okay, well, my word says this, and so you should go to hell. But I don't know, what was your truth? It doesn't work that way. And this is what makes the word in vain they worship me so terrifying. Because you can tear down pagan temples on the hills, but it is harder to tear down pagan temples in the heart. Look at what the prophet Ezekiel said in Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 3. He said, Son of man, these men have set up idols in their hearts and put before them that which causes them to stumble into iniquity. That's sin. Should I let myself be inquired of at all by them? Should I even let them pray to me and that I would even answer them? Because they have set up idols in their hearts. They're trying to worship me without my word. I am a God of the word. Jesus is the word made flesh. He would never do anything contrary to the word. Now check this out. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. When I was, in my, when I was my father's son, tender, and the only one in the sight of my mother, he also taught me. And he said to me, let your heart retain my words, keep my commands, and live. And when you put that together, and later you should look these up, Psalm 78, verses 5 through 8, and Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 and 7, that's the commandment of fathers to know the word to the extent that they could diligently teach the word to their children. That way when your kids go to church and somebody speaks contra to the word, Well, that institution which is instilled to create biblical values, that is the family, a father and a mother, well then they have so instilled the word of the Lord in the hearts of their teenagers when they go to youth group and somebody says something that's not of the word, they say, hey, that's not true. Listen to what it says here in the New Testament in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving Let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Hey, you know what? We're on a roll. Let's keep rolling. Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, that is the Bible, He meditates day and night. He thinks about it. He reads it all day, all even into the night. And wherever he goes, he talks about it. Now consider the full quote of Isaiah. As I'm confident that Jesus was expecting the expert scribes and Pharisees would be doing when he's using these images and speaking to them. So if you're experts in the law, then you're obviously going to understand that when I'm saying to you, what I'm saying to you is actually me quoting Isaiah to you. Okay? The rabbinical way of teaching, by the way, is to quote a part of Scripture. This is how you get kids to learn, right? You would say something like, for God so loved the, and they would say, world. And then you would say, uh-huh, so, right, yeah, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And so now you have that they're learning scriptures, they're going back and forth. And so this rabbinical way of teaching is to quote part of scripture. And as Jesus is quoting part of scripture, typically a student would finish the scripture even in their own minds. And so now Jesus, think about this, is treating the expert seminary professors and the students, I mean, uh, and and the scribes, as if they were his students. Isaiah 29, verses 13 and 14 says this, Therefore the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandments of men. Are we not seeing this here in Scripture? Therefore, behold, I will again do a marvelous thing among this people, a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hidden. Now, by this quote, Jesus was announcing the purpose of his miracles. Along with 
his statements of understanding that only the humble will receive the teaching and the testimony of Jesus that he is the Messiah. Let's keep reading in Matthew chapter 15, verse 10. He says this, And when he had called the multitude to himself, he said, Hear and understand. It's not what goes into the mouth which defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a man. So they come to him saying, These men are breaking the tradition of the rabbis. And he says, You're breaking the tradition of God's word. And then he turns to the multitude. So you realize he's, this is not a private conversation with the few scribes. They're trying to call him out in public while he's in the middle of a sermon. And so once he addresses them and shuts them up, he turns immediately to the multitude. And he says, it's not what goes into a mouth that defiles you. It's what comes out of a mouth. So Jesus is speaking of two things. He's speaking, number one, of food. Hey, listen, it's not, the, it's not what goes into your mouth. That is, you didn't wash your hands, so your hands are dirty. So, so that makes what is typically kosher food to be unkosher because you just didn't wash your hands properly. That's their rule. That's not in the Bible. But not only is he speaking of food, but he's speaking of the oral traditions, right? What they call the oral Torah or the oral Torah, man-made teaching. So it's not what goes into your mouth. that def- It's what comes out of your mouth. The oral Torah is what is defiling you guys because these guys are wrapping you and binding you up into their man-made rules so that they can control you. And by the way, they're not even living according to the Bible themselves. Is it any wonder that they wanted to kill him? Chapter 15, verse, uh, let's go to uh, uh, verse 12. He says, And then his disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? This makes me laugh every time I <laughs> every time I read it. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. What happened to our Christian culture? That it has chosen to define meekness as puny weakness. No, meekness is power under submission to the Holy Spirit's leading. And they say when you, when, you, when you train a horse who's a wild Mustang in order to submit to the saddle and the bridle so that a rider can actually use it, it can be useful. You know, nobody thinks that a horse, especially if you, the closer you get to a horse, the more you realize that they're powerful. They're about the most powerful animal that you'll ever be close to. And nobody thinks that a, that a horse is, is powerless or he's weak or puny. No, he's strong, but he's not useful until he becomes meek. And that has to become under submission, and that's what we become. When filled with the Holy Spirit, we read, we read the Bible, and he teaches us the word of the Lord. And he's true. He's not a lie. You, you can always trust the Holy Spirit's leading, okay? And then when you put yourself under submission to the Holy Spirit's leading, as according to the word of the Lord, well, that's when you start to walk in power as a believer, okay? And so, therefore, when we're in the word, we realize that sometimes strong rebuke is necessary. So why have so many church leaders lost their stomach for the prophetic word, okay? I'm not saying go be a jerk for Jesus, but I'm just telling you that if not offending people becomes your highest priority, well then offending God has become your lowest priority. Let's keep reading in Matthew chapter 15, verse 13. He says, But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Just because you attend a megachurch, with a full parking lot and uh, fancy sound and lights and who knows what, right? They might have massage chairs, right, for pews. I don't, I'm making it up. I don't know. But just because you attend a super mega church doesn't mean that the plant that is inside hasn't died. It's just a big, pretty pot if they're not walking according to the Word. God has a way of uprooting pastors along with their unbiblical root value systems. Let's keep reading in Matthew chapter 15, verse 14. He says, Let them be alone. They are blind leading the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, then both will fall 
into a ditch. We're going to read for a little while. Verse 15, then Peter answered and said, explain this parable to us. So Jesus said, are you still without understanding? Do you not yet understand whatever enters into the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. Verse 19, for out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts. Once again, we're looking at the oral Torah versus the word of the Lord. Out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, and blasphemies. And these are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. Peter is going to draw from this conversation later in Acts chapter 10. And the Lord is going to send Peter to the Gentile home of a Roman centurion named Cornelius. But first Peter is being shown, uh, will be shown a uh, vision of unclean animals lowered on a sheet from heaven. You can go check it out later, Acts chapter 10. It's a great story. And he sees this vision of unclean animals which are lowered on a sheet from heaven. And the voice of the Lord will say, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. And then Peter gets into this argument, really, with the Lord. Peter will then refuse to eat non-kosher food. I, I've, since the day I was born, I've never eaten anything that is not kosher. And the Lord will remind Peter of today's conversation. Let's go there just for a moment. Acts chapter 10, verse 15. And a voice spoke to Peter again a second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. Surely in that moment, Peter says, hold on. It's not what goes into a mouth which defiles a man. It's what comes out of a mouth. God is going to call him to profess out from his mouth, not not rabbinical tradition, which says, I'm not going to go in and eat with the centurion. No, the word of the Lord, who wants all men everywhere to repent and turn to him. Let's keep reading in Matthew chapter 15, verse 21. And then Jesus went out from there, and he departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. Verse 23, But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out even after us. This Gentile cries out to Jesus, Son of David. Do you remember the very first verse of the book of Matthew? Remember how we talked and we learned who the Son of David is? That that is a specific title for the shepherd of Israel. And remember how son of Abraham was a specific title which spoke because Abraham is a Gentile from Ur of the Chaldees. There were no Jewish people at that time. And so this Gentile hears the call of the Lord and he follows him by faith. He believes and that's counted to him as righteousness. Now from him came the Jewish people. But on the day that he left, he was just a garden variety pagan Gentile who heard the word of the Lord and was willing to to leave, just like the Moabite girl Ruth said, you know, your people are my people and, uh, and uh, your God is my God. And so Abram says, I don't know who this God is and he's not even telling me where we're going. We're going to the place that he will show me. Don't even know what that means. But what we do know is that the first verse of Matthew, we have both salvation for the Jew, son of David, and for anyone who would believe, even if they're Gentiles, son of Abraham. Now, this Gentile woman, now let's think about this, has called out to the Messiah of Israel. The Bible says he came first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. It doesn't mean that he came exclusively to the Jew, because there's Gentiles who, who definitely saw the grace and mercy and I think became believers of Jesus and followers of Jesus even before he goes to the cross. But he came primarily first to the Jews. That was his chief reason for coming. And so this Gentile calls out to the Messiah, but she calls out to him in Jewish terms. So Jesus is ignoring her, okay? And perhaps that's because she may have been faking that she was Jewish. Hey, there's a Jewish guy, and he's doing miraculous things for Jewish people. 
I'm going to jump in among the crowd and I'm going to call out to him like they're calling out to him. Now, she's not a seminary student. She doesn't know the difference between son of David or son of Abraham, but she's calling out to him. And so the, the idea is she might have even been faking to be Jewish, to not be noticed among all this throng of Jewish people. And maybe she could have got what she wanted without actually having to identify herself. And so she's probably hoping that he won't even know that she's a Gentile. She's looking basically for the benefits of being a believer without actually being one. And we see that in the church all the time. People that show up at church and they just love it. They love the music. They love the people. They love going to a life group. They love the fact when their wife got sick, somebody made them a casserole. They're getting all the benefits of being a believer until they go stand before the Lord. And he says, turn away from me. I never knew you. No, I went to church. I tithed. I was actually a volunteer. I even worked in children's ministry and parking lot ministry. None of those things make you a believer. We move on to Matthew chapter 15, verse 24. But he answered and he says to the, hey, Jesus, please do something about this lady. She won't shut up. And now she's, now she's yelling out after us, trying to get us to do, get you to do something. And Jesus answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Why? Because you're calling out to the son of David, and that is the ministry of the son of David. He was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Okay? And check this out in Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 20 through 24. Therefore, thus says the Lord of God to them, Behold, I myself will judge between the fat and the lean sheep. Because you have pushed with side and shoulder, and you have butted all the weak ones with your horns, and scattered them abroad. Verse 22, Therefore I will save my flock, and they shall no longer be a prey, and I will judge between sheep and sheep. And I will establish one shepherd over all of them, and he shall feed them, my servant David, and he shall Feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David, a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. This is where we get the idea of the son of David. So you're a Gentile and you're calling out to me, the son of David. And within the ministry of the son of David, what you're asking me to do is not within the scope of whom it is that you're calling out to. Why? Because you don't even know who I am. You don't even understand the concept. And I think he's calling out a con from here. But, but he's not just trying to call her out as in to make fun of her. He would never do that. He's really trying to draw the proper confession out of her. Matthew chapter 15, verse 25. And then she came and she, what, worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. And I believe that she's no longer pretending to be Jewish. Verse 26, but Jesus answered and said, it's not good to take the children's bread, right? Shepherd of Israel. It's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Now, a lot of people have an issue with this term, the children's bread and the little dogs. Much is lost in translation, right? Like when Jesus says, you know, what is to his mom, you know, when she's asking him to turn water into wine, and he says, what is that to me, woman? And you think, good night, if I talk to my mom like that, right, the next thing I'd see is the paramedics trying to wake me up. <laughs> when I was growing up, we didn't have time out, by the way. We had lights out. <laughs> you talk to your mom like that, it's lights out. Well, just like that situation, and this is, a lot is lost in the translation. First, the Hebrew word for Gentile and dog are very similar to each other. Also, the word which Jesus is using in the original language was not the word which is used for a vicious dog, but rather for a little dog, like a puppy. And so this conversation between Jesus and this lady is not confrontational. And Jesus already knows he's going to honor her request. He's drawing out the proper confession. Why? Because it matters to the Lord. So this conversation is not confrontational. It's playful. Matthew chapter 15, verse 27. He says, she said, yes, Lord, but even the little dogs, even the puppies eat the crumbs. She says, hey, it's not good for me to take this bread and throw it to the puppies because the kids need this bread. And she goes, but even the puppies eat the crumbs from the bread, which fall from their master's table. 
What is she doing? Well, she's admitting that she's been listening to him teach. And while she doesn't know everything about being a believer, she knows enough. She's not pretending to be a believer at this point. When she cries out to him as the Lord and says, Lord, help me. Well, at this point now, she is a believer. Not pretending to be a believer, not pretending to be Jewish, but she believes. And Jesus has been drawing out this profession of faith from her through this whole thing. He, doesn't, he, wasn't, he didn't wake up on the bad side of the, you know, of, the, of the cot this morning, and he's just in a bad, you know, don't mess with Jesus this morning before coffee, right? Because he's in a bad mood. No, no. This is his grace and his mercy toward her. Don't walk around as a fake, trying to get God to do something for you, but, but you don't actually want to identify as a follower. But the moment that she calls him Lord and says, Lord, help me, then she understands that he doesn't just have the power to help the Jewish people, that he is the God of all creation, as it were. And therefore, she says, help me, because I know that you can help me. Matthew chapter 15, verse 28. And then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, your, uh, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And then her daughter was healed from that very hour. Man. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God for everyone who believes. For the Jew first, and also for the Greek or the Gentile. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Just as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Jesus says what? Your faith is great. Man, let's not stop there. Mark chapter 9, verses uh, 23 and 24. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. It's not the abundance of our faith. You know, God would answer my prayers if I had more faith. No, the power is not in the amount of faith that you can amass. The power comes through the object of our faith. It is Jesus who has the faith. So if you can believe, that's all you have to do. If you can place your faith in the right object of your faith, then all things are possible to you. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and, said with, and he said with tears, Lord, I believe. Now help my unbelief. And I think that's pretty much where each of us are every day when we're reading the Bible. John chapter 10, verse 16, Jesus said this, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. So she calls out to him, this woman. She's a Gentile. She's calling out to him as a child of Israel. Okay, But he's not just the God of Israel. He's not just the Savior of Israel. He's the God of the world, of all creation. And he's the Savior of the world. And Jesus says in John 16, uh, 10, verse 16, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, and them also I must bring. That doesn't mean that all other religions kind of have a part of the truth, and so if you have a little bit of Buddhism and a little bit of Hindu, no, those things are fake. There's only one way. But Jesus is saying that one way is not exclusive to Jewish people. And the flock that I am going to shepherd is the flock of the world. So just because you're Jews, don't think the Gentiles can't come in. Jesus says, once again, John 10, 16, Other sheep I have which are not of this fold. They're Gentiles. And them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be, what, one flock and one shepherd. There's only one way to salvation. Let's keep reading in Matthew chapter 15, verse 29. Isn't this great? He says, Jesus departed from there, and he skirted the Sea of Galilee, and he went up onto the mountains, uh, onto the mountain, and he sat down there. And uh, then great multitudes came to him, having with them the lame and the blind and the mute and the maimed and many others, and they laid them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. Verse 31, so the multitudes marveled when they saw the mute speaking. And the maimed become whole, and the lame walking, and the blind seeing. And they glorified the God of Israel. Wow. Multitudes marvel. And they're glorifying God when they saw 
the miracles. Now go back for a moment to the last lady he interfaced with. She glorified God before she saw the miracle. She calls him Lord before he had done anything for her. Why? Because she believed and believing was seeing for her. Now you have multitudes that are following, but they're believing and they're glorifying God when they saw the miracles. Remember that sign of Messiah that was prophesied by Isaiah? And although there were many, let's go just for a moment to this one. Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13 and 14. He says, Therefore the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but they have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men. Their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men. They think they're worshiping me rightly, but they're not worshiping me according to the word of the Lord, but by the commandment of men. The commandment of men has now become the word of the Lord to them. And there's a problem, is there not? Therefore, behold, I will again do a marvelous work among this people, a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish. Remember how this all started? We got the pros from Jerusalem showing up, the Pharisees and the seminary professing scribes. The wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent or their faithful. If you're faithful according to something that's not biblical, that's not faith. That's just you being disciplined toward a cult. The understanding of their prudent men shall be hidden. The Messiah's supporting evidence as to why people should abandon the commandments of men and be restored to the word of the Lord by the living word of the Lord, the evidence that they should do this were the marvelous works and wonders. Ah, I don't know. You see, Jesus is now doing miracles wholesale. And now what we see is people are starting to see. But blessed are those who see uh, without having to actually see. You understand what I'm saying? Blessed are those who believe and then see, because believing is seeing, but seeing is not always believing. And guess what? There's a lot of these people who will follow Jesus, and when they see the miracle faucet start to turn off, when he goes, yeah, I'm not doing miracles for you today. You should have seen enough already. Well, then one by one, they start to walk away. Let's keep reading in Matthew chapter 15, verse 32. He says this, And now Jesus called the disciples to himself, and he said, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me for three days and they have nothing to eat and I do not want to send them away hungry because they will faint on the way. Verse 33 says, Then his disciples said to him, Where could we get enough bread in the wilderness? There's not a 7-Eleven here. There's not a grocery store here. Where could we get enough bread in the wilderness to fill such a great multitude. And Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven, and only a few little fish. I love that. Hey, Jesus uh, uh, Jesus says, Hey, you know what? These people are hungry, and we need to feed them. And they said, um, I, don't, I don't know that you understand, Jesus. There's not a grocery store around here. There's no place for us to get these things. And uh, he says, uh, well, what do you have? And they said, well, really, there's, there's 12 of us, and there's you, and we got a couple of other Klingons, you know, people that are just hanging around, and they're with us. So, I mean, we don't even have enough for ourselves. But when Jesus has compassion toward others, and he wants to bless others abundantly, oftentimes he does it through our lack of resources. You see somebody say, well, gosh, I don't even have enough for my own family. I don't think I could help these people out enough. And Jesus is like, you know what? Give it to me. Let me bless it. We have to trust the Lord when he says, yeah, give from your lack of resources. Because we don't really need the resources. We need for the object to our, of our faith to be the one who has all the resources. So give your lack to Jesus. And that let him bless it. And believe me, when you give your lack to Jesus, what you don't have, let him bless it, then it becomes abundance for the need. You say, I don't know, I don't know how that's possible. Guess what? It, if you knew how it was possible, it wouldn't be a miracle. You just go do it without calling out to the Lord. 
And this is not the first time in Scripture, by the way, that this has occurred. The disciples should have known the word of the Lord to know that this had occurred before in Scripture. They should have remembered the scenario from God's word in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 42 through 44. It says this, Then a man from Baal Shalisha uh, came and he brought the man of God, who is Elisha. He, he brought the man of God bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of the barley bread and newly riped grain from his knapsack. And he said, give it to the people that they may eat. But his servant said, what? Shall I set this before 100 men? And again, he said, give it to the people that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left over. And so he set it before them. And they ate and they had some left over according to the word of the Lord. You know, most people who've been Christians and grown up in church, no pastors ever shared that with them. They didn't know that this was a miracle which had been done before in the Old Testament. But one greater than Elisha was standing before them now. Exodus chapter 16, verses 2 through 4. Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by pots of meat. You know, you, when you leave the world and all of a sudden you start pining for the way you used to live in the world. He says, when we, when we sat by pots of meat when we were slaves, and we ate bread until we were full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. And then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven on you. I will make bread rain up in here. And the people shall go out, and they shall gather a certain quota every day, that I may test them whether they walk in my law, that is, according to my teaching, the word of the Lord, or not. So Jesus was not just working in the power of Elisha, but he's also working in the power of Moses by bringing bread. Not only bread, but he's going to bring fish. So now what we realize is this. Elisha never made a miracle happen. Moses never performed a single miracle. They sought the Lord, and the object of their faith is what brought about the miracle. That is the Lord himself. Now, Jesus is not just operating in the power of Elisha in the past, in the power of Moses in the past. He's, he's operating as himself. He had operated for Elisha in the past. He had operated for Moses in the past. And now he himself the living law, the living word of the Lord is standing before them now and he's personally doing these miracles. Let's keep reading here in Matthew chapter 15, verse 36. We're not too far from the end. He says, And he took the seven loaves and the fish and he gave thanks and he broke them and he gave them to his disciples and the disciples gave them to the multitude. I love that. Uh, Let's just finish out the rest of the chapter. And so they all ate and they were filled and they took up seven large baskets full of fragments that were left. And now those who ate were 4,000 men besides women and children. And he sent away the multitude and he got into the boat and he came to the region of Magdala. Whenever you're getting into a boat in the New Testament, and you're going to the other side, it's good to know which side you were on. Well, obviously they were in the wilderness, so they were on the Gentile side. It's not that Gentiles didn't have things to eat over there, it's just that religious Jews would not eat that food because it was not clean. And Jesus didn't say, hey, you know, later we're going to have a sheet lower for Peter, so let's go ahead and get you a sneak peek and go down to the 7-Eleven on the Gentile side and get some food. No, he honored the word of the Lord, and he provided for them kosher food. As a miracle. So when they get on the when they get on the boat and they go to the other side, now we I'm not going to read much of this, but now we get to Matthew chapter 16, and it says, And then the Pharisees and the Sadducees came and testing him, they asked, 
that he would show them a sign from heaven. <laughs> Man, can you believe it? You know, pride will never humbly follow far enough to see miracles. Pride will never humbly follow the Lord far enough to see the miracles. Had these people followed Jesus, these these religious elite who's like, I'm not going over there to be with those dirty Gentiles. Well, they would have seen a Gentile see the favor of the Lord and healing would come to her daughter. Had they followed the Lord humbly, they would have been out in the wilderness too and they would have seen Elisha-level miracles. They would have seen Moses-level miracles. But pride will never humble itself to follow the Lord far enough to experience those miracles. Have you followed the Lord? Have you seen enough of the Lord to know that there is only one way? Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me. Have you surrendered to the Lord and received salvation, been filled with the Holy Spirit, which happens in the moment that you believe? Well, if not, you could do so now. And I'd like to lead you in a prayer where you could speak to the Lord yourself. And you could speak back to Him that you understand the gospel, at least as much as one needs to understand it, that that Jesus is God made flesh, that He died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins, a debt that He didn't owe, but we couldn't pay, and He paid it for us. But the fact that, that He rose from the grave proved that His sacrifice was honored by the Lord. And He's alive today offering you salvation and eternal life if you would turn from your sin and receive it. But you have to humble yourself in order to see that miracle of salvation. It's not a miracle you do. It's not because of the abundance of your faith. It's because of your faith in the one who is abundantly holy on our behalf. So why don't you pray to the Lord even now, just like this. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner and I can't save myself. I know that you are holy and perfect and I fall short of that. But I also saw today that salvation is offered to both Jews and Gentiles. That's everyone in the word, uh, in the world, if they would turn from their sin and receive it. So, Lord, I believe Jesus paid the penalty for my sin on the cross. I believe that He rose from the grave, and He's alive today, offering me forgiveness of all my sin, bought by His blood. And I believe that he's risen from the grave. And I believe that if I would turn from my sin, I too could receive salvation. So Lord, I'm turning from my sin now. Come into my life now and fill me with your Holy Spirit. And I commit to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm Steve Wiggins, and this is the Groundworks Ministries Podcast.